Okay, here we go. So we're just waiting for our guest, Dr. Trumbell. Thank you all for attending. Join the anonymous Blue Man crew again. Yeah. Man behind the machine. Hey, JK, what's up? The man behind the machine. That's me. What's up, JK? Yo. Hmm. Hey, Dave. Hey, guys. Hi, Bill. Bill, how you doing? Good. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Hey, um, Dave uh, McMurtry gave a really nice history talk at VCF. He did everything except the computers. It was actually pretty interesting. Yeah, I yeah, I missed it. I wouldn't say you missed anything, Bill. Don't be modest. All the suspense. <laughs> Somebody mentioned the pie. Is that you, Rick? No, it was me and pie fifteen forty one. You're talking about? Yeah, are you using that? I have it, but like I said, it it has a lot of uh, wires. I'm using. I uh, basically put in an SD card reader into my sixty four to. So that way I don't see it. Yeah, I'll show it to you, I guess, one second. Yeah, that'd be great. I think the thing he's talking about, me and Rick built one of those. He's talking about the thing that's in the pie that emulates the. Oh, you want to see that? Okay, one second. I'll find that. And so, because I think me and Finger put one of those together, and I, we spent like a good evening really uh, making it dirty. That thing was my like, God. There, it was just a pile of wires when we were done, but it worked. <laughs> that's the important part, right? Well, we'll have to get to that soon. Dr. Tremel has joined us. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Please excuse my blue screen. My basic is running all over. Your your blue screen has uh, crept over and is masking your face. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. You're most welcome. Sorry for being a couple of minutes late. No problem. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tremel. Uh, he, he received his Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Santa Clara University in 1976 and earned his Master of Arts, Master of Philosophy, and Doctor of Philosophy degrees all in physics from Columbia University. He worked in the Columbia Astrophysics Lab under Professor Gary Cannon, now at the University of California at Irvine. Um, Fresh out of graduate school, Tremel joined his father and two brothers. His father bought Atari from Warner Communications in 1984. For the next 12 years, Tremel was involved in development of Atari's products as vice president of software, managing an internal group of dozen of pro dozens of programmers while interacting worldwide with software developers and contact contract programmers. Uh, he's retired from Atari since age 42. Um, and 
has been a volunteer eighth grade astronomy teacher for the past 10 years at Chabot Space and Science Center since 2000. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. You're most welcome. So after, after that expansive introduction, what left is there? I, you've, you've, got, you've got all of me. Well, that's it. I guess we're done. Uh, unless anyone has any other questions. I, like, I have a question. Like say you. Hi, have, Bill. Hey, Leonard. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. Have you ever broken a telescope? Have I ever broken a telescope? Um, no. Uh, I've never broken a telescope. I've, uh, I've had a solar filter disintegrate <laughs> um, while I was using it, which I definitely um, would not recommend. Was the sun involved? Yeah, I was look so I, I had one of these little <laughs> four and a half inch reflector thingies. I think I got it when I was 13 from my bar mitzvah. And uh, it had one of the most dangerous um, accessories you can buy a solar filter that screwed into the front of the eyepiece. So it blocked the light of the sun quite effectively, but it did it at the near the focal point of the telescope. Right. Right. So the uh, filter got incredibly hot. Differentially. And, <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was not uncommon for these things to break. So I'm looking at the sun through the telescope and I hear this grinding creaking sound <laughs> and I pulled my eye away just as it cracked and wow. it singed my hair. Wow. It so would have blinded me. You, if I you were injured it. by a telescope then. Well, my hair was. <laughs> <laughs> you were near and at the time I had a lot more than I do now. So yes, it was uh, <laughs> it was not as much of an issue. It, we all did, actually. Yes, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, other, somebody else, go ahead. I just wanted to get That's that. Okay, in. thanks, Bill. I appreciate you breaking the ice there, uh, Dr. Trebell. Um, yes, sir. I'm, I've been really excited and uh, really oh, and, contemplating. And, and, and yeah. please, um, <laughs> Leonard is fine, sir. Dr. Trebell, not necessary. Thank you. Uh, Leonard, I appreciate it. I just You're want to let welcome, you know, Nika. I cannot excuse my sentimentality here. Um, and I will preface this by saying how much your father means to me. I could say that for the Commodore community, but your father, I mean, is a legend. And uh, I, I love that man. I, I can't say anything more about your father. So um, well, I, I was pretty fond of him story. myself. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, what was it like growing up? And how did your father influence you um, and your intellectual huh. curiosity? Um, in terms of intellectual curiosity, not at all. Um, he was not a particularly intellectually curious person. Uh, he was perfectly happy. Um, not thinking about things that weren't practical. Um, he had a fourth grade education that was never really augmented by anything other than the College of Hard Knocks. So his formal education ended um, in, let's see, he was probably in fourth grade or so. Uh, so he was born in 1928, and when the Germans came in in 39, so 11, yeah, so right around there, um, he, his formal education ended when the uh, Germans came in and sent all of the, the Jews to the ghetto, uh, and he never took a class in his life after that. Uh, I like to joke that my parents were illiterate in three languages. Because uh, they, uh, you know, being born in Poland, they I, they could uh, understand and speak Polish. They didn't read it particularly well. They understood and spoke and read some Yiddish. Um, and when they came to the U.S., they learned English. But uh, from as far as formal education, uh, and in, you know what 
we would call intellectual curiosity, that was not a big part of my dad's life. Um, yeah. On the other hand, of uh, being a person of personal integrity, uh, your word is your bond. Um, that was a, a, a lesson that he inculcated into me at an early age, and it has become a, a primary element of, of my being. Uh, and anyone that met him knows that he was the kind of guy that, you know, sucked the oxygen out of a room. Uh, so he could not help uh, but make an impression on you. Uh, and, you know, living with that was, uh, you know, that lessened it to some extent, but, but not much. But he escapes Nazi persecution. He escapes. Well, Europe. he didn't escape Nazi persecution. He survived Nazi survived. persecution. Yeah, he was. Um, so his last encounter with the, the Nazi regime was in a uh, slave labor camp uh, in Hanover, Germany, uh, called Alm. And the uh, Americans were advancing on the camp, <clears throat> excuse me, and the um, Germans said to the prisoners, uh, come with us if you want to live. Um, and they left the camp and Shortly thereafter, they uh, machine gunned all of the uh, um, all of the prisoners that they took with them. My dad was basically dying of probably typhoid fever, possibly typhus. It's it's unclear, and he was too sick to move. Um, so he was just lying, essentially passed out on his bed or on the the bunk um, when the Americans arrived. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't really call that escaping. Okay, thank you for the correction. So he's sure. survivor, survivor of the camps. Yep. So he comes to New York. How did he get into the typewriter business? So um, <clears throat> he uh, he was always a, a, a very. Uh, He's very good with people. He was able to, uh, uh, to get people to, to do things for him and to explain how to, how to get things done. Uh, he wanted to go where, where, the, uh, uh, where prospects look good. And everything he heard of said that the US was, was the place to be. Uh, so he went, uh, uh, went to the... Uh, a U.S. displaced persons camp and asked, uh, you know, what, what do I do? Eventually wound up um, in New York uh, through the aid of a couple of, um, of international um, Jewish philanthropies. And in order to learn the culture and the language, he joined the U.S. Army. And his first stint in the Army he was um, a cook and uh, left the army after a couple of years and then um, went back, uh, was called back uh, when the Korean War happened, um, was never deployed, but his job then was as an office machine um, repairman. And that's where he learned to repair typewriters. Uh, and when he left through a complicated set of, uh, of um, interactions, which uh, are slowly being documented uh, by um, Dave McCurtry. Hi, hi there, Dave. <laughs> um, he wound up getting the contract uh, for, the, uh, for the base's office machine um, repair system, and that was the beginning of what became Commodore.
did he have a vision that he would become so influential and start a revolution in computing? Did he Absol- have Absolutely not. <laughs> no. 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 He just wanted to be successful at business. He just wanted to be successful in business. He, uh, he wanted to have, uh, be able to give his family a firm financial foundation. Um, I remember, I'm trying to place the conversation in time. Um, and it probably would have been after he left Commodore, but probably before uh, we all left Atari. Uh, he said that his goal was to make it to the point where his kids didn't need um, to work because they had enough to survive, but not enough to really live comfortably. Uh, The goal was work was important because if you didn't need to work, you would be too lazy to, um, to be useful to society. So the, the idea of becoming, I mean, I'm trying to remember when it was at one point in, in the Atari days, uh, I think for one year, dad was on the uh, fortune 400 list of the 400 richest people in the world. Um, he certainly had no dream or even desire to ever be on such a list. Hope that answers your question. It, it, it's almost unbelievable. I believe you. I, it just doesn't seem consistent with somebody who is treating business as a war, you know, and is coming out of this thinking that we have to move towards the East. And I was going to get your impressions about what his connections were with the East, Japan, et cetera. And how okay, that so about? his, um, so the, the way it's consistent is the, um, he had a, an idea, a set of ideas about what the best way to do business was. And his goal was to, um, was to be a successful businessman, not to hit a particular financial goal. Uh, more was more and more was better. Uh, there was no, uh, no target for him personally. Um, but yeah, it, it, you're, you're making the assumption that, that the, the goal was, a, uh, was to the hit a certain threshold and then stop. He couldn't stop. Uh, there, were, there was no way to stop. Um, so as far as the Far East was concerned, um, shortly after the... Uh, so when, when Commodore was just starting in the uh, electronic calculator business uh, with the introduction of a couple of calculators from Casio, he made some trips to Japan and found that the, the work ethic and the uh, desire and uh, target of excellence that is so deeply ingrained in the, um, in the Japanese culture was extremely um, uh, positive as far as he was concerned. He thought it was, it was great. So he wanted to do as much with Japan as he could uh, because working against them was, uh, was, was certainly a, uh, uh, a really dangerous uh, thing to try to do. Um, but he knew that they, as, a, as an economic powerhouse, long before they really became one, he was quite convinced that they would. 
I had a question that I was going to ask that I kind of skipped my mind, uh, but I'll bring it back. Uh, what was your first computer ever? Oh, first computer experience or first computer that I actually had in my hands? Uh, both. One that you uh, so, owned and one that you experienced. Uh, so my, my first experience with a computer would have been a programming class that I took in Toronto, where we would, um, we had these, you know, Mark Sense cards that we would put the, you know, fill little bubbles in and send those out. And the next day we'd get back the printed output. Uh, and I learned uh, a toy assembly language, um, basic and a little bit of Fortran um, in that class. Uh, and the first computer that I actually had in my grubby little hands and played with was a uh, MOS technology Kim One. Hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, one of those, Bill. Um. So I understand that you went to Atari in 84. Yep. Um, and as far as Commodore is concerned, what interactions did you have, you know, um, and get to witness, you know, prior to dad leaving the company? Did you spend time at the HQ or? Yeah, so my, so dad was, was such a, a business person that uh, Commodore was part of my life for you know as long as I can remember. Um, so I was five uh, when Commodore was founded. Um, and going to see him at the office, uh, you know, pick him up at the office, stop by the office on the way to someplace was something that we always did. Uh, so, uh, my my first experience, I I, I could not uh, extract from the cobwebs of memory. Um, the first sort of distinct involvement um, is kind of funny. Uh, the first electronic calculators that Commodore had, the um, L one thousand and five hundred E, were being shown at the National Office Machine Dealers Association meeting in Chicago. I, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but it, it probably would have been um, in 1970 or so. Um, Dave probably uh, can chime in and 67. give me the right year. 67, okay, so earlier than that. Um, and that, that matches, so yeah, uh, I would have been, you know, 13, 14 years old. Um, and I knew how to operate these things better than any of the dealers did. Um, because I was always a nerd. Um, or maybe it's a geek. I'm not sure what, you know, which, which word fits better. Um, but I remember demoing these machines on the floor uh, at NAMDA. Um, I, in college, I worked for Commodore, uh, three out of the four, um, summers while I was in college. Uh, the reason for it being three out of the four was, <laughs> was really pretty funny. Um, one, uh, one summer, I remember getting in the car with dad. Uh, prior to him heading to the office, and uh, we're we're driving up to uh, up to the office, and and he said, you know, why'd you get in the car this morning? And I said, well, to go to work with you. So how do you know you'd have a job? How basically how dare you make the assumption that just because you're the boss's son, you will have a job? You have no right. To, to take a job away from somebody else. Um, 
don't assume you've got a job unless I tell you. So the next year, I didn't. Um, I found a job, a uh, summer job, working for a physics professor at the Ames Research Center who was a adjunct professor at the university that I was going to. And the first day of summer holiday, dad said, okay, let's go to the office. And I said, I already have a job somewhere else. Uh, and told him that I, I did this because of what had happened the previous summer. Um, he never let that happen again. That's a great story. <laughs> Out of those three, three summers, what were you doing? Um, so the first was um, driving a forklift um, in, the, uh, in the warehouse. Uh, a, a highly wow. skilled job, you know, moving, uh, moving boxes around. Um, the second was repairing electronic calculators. So we hmm. had, uh, um, we had a small facility there where we actually repaired electronic calculators. I, I learned how they operated and could diagnose them. This was when they had, you know, multiple chips and you could actually take them apart and fix them. Um, and then uh, the last one was, was a really interesting experience. I remember walking in with dad to uh, the facility at 901 California Avenue in, in Palo Alto. He introduces me to the guy that's in charge of the uh, calculators that were being designed by Commodore. And he says, Dado, this is my son. Give him something useful to do. And after a couple of minutes of thinking, um, I'm handed a assembly listing for a calculator and the uh, definition of the instruction set for the custom processor that runs it. And Dado says, come back when you understand. Uh, and I spent the next several days going through and learning how at the bit level, uh, a calculator did add, you know, floating point, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Um, and that, that, was, that was a non-trivial task. Uh, and I wound up designing a couple of uh, calculators. Or writing the uh, writing the firmware for them. Do you remember who that head of uh, calculators was? Um, Dado Deodato Bonatao, who went on to um, I think found uh, S three, one of the um, uh, graphics and some and, and uh, custom processor uh, uh. companies in the uh, in the Silicon Valley. Wow. And a fantastic human being. Just a great guy. Yeah, the uh, a, a bit of a um, controversy had occurred. At some point, the guy who at the time was Dado's boss um, and the then head of the calculator stuff uh, left Commodore in a huff. Um, he was, he, he, he wanted to be the, uh, you know, the prime everything. And that, that didn't work so well with, uh, uh, when every time my father would walk by the, you know, as I said, the oxygen got sucked out of the room. So, you know, distracted away from this guy. Uh, so he was designing a calculator chip. When he left, he implied that there was a bug in the design that would be impossible for anyone else to find. <laughs> and, um, but it would completely cripple the device. And we had found out that the, uh, one of the, the algorithms used for doing one of the trigonometric functions. And if I think about it long enough, I might remember. 
um, if you, there was a range of values, if you plug those numbers into the calculator, it would hang. It would never come back from giving its, uh, from doing its computations. And we hired a really, really smart, <laughs> um, very, very sophisticated mathematical um, engineer to diagnose this problem and tell us how to fix it. Uh, a name you may remember, uh, Shiraz Shivji. That was how Shiraz came into Commodore. Um, and we did, uh, we did fix that. Uh, the calculators that I wrote the uh, firmware for did not use that algorithm. Um, the new algorithm that Shiraz introduced to us is something I still have um, uh, just you know, engraved in my mind. Was part of your father's success the fact that he could gather and collect the most brilliant minds that could innovate? You said something earlier uh, uh, that he was able to manage and bring get things done. Was that part of his success at Commodore? I, well, because he had no technical expertise whatsoever himself, he couldn't really judge. Um, he was awfully good at seeing through people's, you know, excuse the expression, bullshit. Um, so it was hard to, uh, hard to snow him, but a sufficiently um, polished and um, sophisticated sales pitch could fool him. Um, trying to remember the name of the company. There was a company that was trying to get big funding for something that they called the wafer scale integration technology. Sinclair? Uh, no. Um, and it, it, was, uh, it was US. It was um, a bunch of people from various semiconductor manufacturers trying to raise hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. Um, and he gave me the uh, prospectus and, and, uh, and sales sheet for it, you know, the, the blurb and said, what do you think? And I read it and just broke out laughing because um, it was just pie in the sky, ridiculous hype. And he was furious at me. Um, you know, what, what the hell is wrong with you? You, you, you know, uh, I was in my teens or early twenties or something. And um, I explained to him, you know, what assumptions they were making and why that didn't work and what the current problems were. I had learned enough about semiconductor manufacturing um, those couple of summers at, at uh, Commodore where we had been intimately involved in the design of, of custom semiconductors. Um, so he, he was susceptible to, uh, to some amount of, of, of sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, blowing up, blowing smoke up your ass. But um, I think the biggest um, ingredients to his success were his, uh, he was brilliant. Uh, his ability to see connections and uh, find vulnerabilities in other systems and how to take advantage of systems that, that he was involved in. He, he could see solutions to problems that most people didn't recognize existed. Um, so I think the, the biggest success was he was just damn smart. Um, and he motivated people through a combination of absolute support. You need something, you ask for it, you get it as long as it's something close to reasonable. But you have, you're given, I can see Bill nodding, 
you're given a timeline that is completely ridiculous. There's no way a human can do things in the amount of time that my father would consistently demand things be done in. Um, and if you didn't make at least really good progress and have a clear path to getting it done by that time, you were out. Um, so if you, uh, if you could survive under those incredibly high pressure situations, um, you, did, you did damn well. Did that sound about right, Bill? You, you were damned if you did and damned if you didn't when you accepted the mission, right? Because <laughs> if you said you were going to get it done, you better damn well get it done. That was a sin. And so, if you didn't, yep. uh, did he just can you out the spot? You, you weren't loyal <laughs> and yeah, what are you doing in that position? Yeah, yeah, just somebody else plays that that's how it, and, and i have to say leonard when you're talking about his work ethic and everything coming from the trench i gotta say that's the boss that was how we felt he he you you talk about him sucking the air out of the room well we we all felt that even long after he was in the room so it was it was a very loyal crew at the core yep Okay, so I'm going to ask a question here that Please. might get some reactions. And obviously, <laughs> we could spend a lot of time on this question. Before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it with uh, my my experience. Uh, the VIC-20 was my first computer. Uh -huh. um, I got that on my birthday when it came out. Um, so it was just influential in my thinking and my development. Um, and then I got the Commodore 64 afterwards. You know, it, it's, it was everything that I knew that computing was at the time. Now, with that said, what happened to Commodore and your father's leaving and, and all that, um, you know? Um, oh, that's, 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 that's very, very simple. Yeah. Um, the stories that you've been told and were told recently um, about uh, there being a, uh, a disagreement between my father and Irving about um, dad bringing in his three sons to be vice presidents at the company and Irving saying, no, you can't do that is complete and utter hogwash. Uh, there was no such desire there were no such discussions. There was no problem of that sort because there was no plan to do that or any thought of doing that. Uh, remember my dad said, I said part of what my father um, instilled in me was a sense of, of, of you know, doing the right thing. There are a set of rules, you've got to follow them. This is, this is what's right. Um, he was, um, he understood at a fundamental and primal level that as the chief operating officer, they didn't use that name, uh, that term at the time, but president um, of a public corporation, you have an obligation to your shareholders to do things right and to do the best job you could. And as Commodore was getting more and more successful, there was more and more money available to do stuff. And um, Irving uh, was doing, doing stuff. He would take the, the, uh, the company jet and go on a trip because he wanted to. Um, he would take various... Um, excursions, he would take advantage of his position as chairman of the company, um, sometimes to the detriment of the company. Um, and at the uh, at CS in 1984, uh, dad uh, confronted him and said, you can't do this anymore. We're a public company. That's illegal. But more importantly, it's wrong. And you got to stop. And Irving said, no. And dad said, well, 
as long as I'm the president, it can't go on. And Irving said, goodbye. So he left. Now, a really wonderful coincidence happened that ties into this. It's, it's sort of a cute story. I hope you like it. Um, the Corvette had just been um, resurrected from the ashes. A new version of the Corvette came out. And for months, my father was talking about how much he loved that new vet. He thought it was a great thing. So my two brothers, my older and, and uh, younger brother were out in California uh, with my dad. I was in graduate school in New York. Uh, so I was not personally involved in this, but I you know, talked to my family and knew what was going on. And uh, the three of us decided, okay, we'll chip in and buy him a vet. So Gary took him to various Corvette dealers and figured out, you know, what color, what color interior, what options, what accessories, everything, found exactly what he wanted, bought the car, had it delivered to the hotel in Vegas. And one afternoon during the show, Gary arranges to meet dad at the front door. Um, and dad walks out, goes, that's it. That's the car. That is exactly the car I want. And he walks over to it and starts talking about how, oh, it's got this and it's got this color and it's, you know, I, this is perfect. And Gary reaches into his pocket and hands him the keys. Beautiful. And that was the car dad hopped in the car and drove home. What and that's how he left it? And that's how he left um, Commodore. What color was it? Uh, hell if I remember, I'm not a car guy. You told me yellow. <laughs> Sounds oh. right. Yeah, I, I do not remember. So literally your dad in this kind of video game is synth wave kind of, you know, background just drives into the sunset with his dream <laughs> car. Unbelievable. Well, so now, of course, when you go from um, an incredibly hands-on, very, very involved operation of a company whose uh, market capitalization, stock price, doubled at least every year for a decade and had just passed a billion dollars in annual sales. Uh, you can't go from that to nothing um, instantly. And, and he was unable to do so. Uh, so he, uh, he, he didn't dried off into the sunset. As we know, there were things that happened after that. So he, but he, he decides to buy Atari because as you said, he couldn't stop where he no. was. He had to continue. No, he had, he had no thoughts, ideas, or inclinations that either Atari was available or that he wanted it. Um, what happened instead is he, uh, he went on a, a round the world trip to try and calm down and to, as he put it, um, thank all of the suppliers around the world for making possible the success, the success of Commodore. At the same time, Atari was losing $2 million a working day. So if you just take the amount of money that they lost, divide it by five days a week, 52 weeks in a year, $2 million a day were being lost. And this was threatening to bankrupt Warner Communications. So a merchant bank that was working with um, Warner contacted my father and said, are you interested in buying this? 
and it took some uh, uh, some convincing and some uh, negotiating because dad had already started another company. Um, so one of the constant, but very small thorns in his side was when people saw our last names, um, they would pronounce it Tremiel. Um, so he started a company called Tremel Technology Limited. He thought it was very clever. Um, the first kind of electronics he was familiar with were TTL chips. So having a, an electronics company whose initials were TTL was just, you know, he thought that was, was really clever. Um, it was spelled T-R-A-M-E-L so that he called, would force people to pronounce it correctly. Instead, that caused people to pronounce it Trammel. Um, so that didn't work. But um, TTL already existed, was running, had um, a bunch of uh, engineers from uh, Commodore, including Shiraz Shivji, designing what would become the Atari ST before the Atari deal was anything that resembled um, done or even really began. Um, so he had already started something. It, you know, it, it wasn't, oh, I quit Commodore. I want to keep doing something. I think I'll go, about, go buy Atari. Did not work that way at all. As far as uh, leaving Commodore, uh, then why invest in Amiga if the... Commodore did not in, Commodore did not invest in Amiga um, while my father was there. All of the interactions between Commodore and Amiga happened after my father left. Yes, so your father lent Amiga what a million dollars? My father lent Amiga no. nothing. My father had no interactions with Amiga whatsoever. Okay, well, then there's uh, some false histories being circulated online. Uh, there are many, uh, yeah. uh, many, some of which have been propagated by this very institution, uh, by one of your more recent speakers. But uh, as far as the Amiga thing is concerned, um, so Amiga was started by some ex Atari engineers and they were running out of money in early 1984, maybe it was late 1983. And they had a deal with Atari for, I think, I think it was half a million dollars, uh, which they had to repay by a date. I think it was July 30th or something, 1984. Um, and if they didn't repay by that date, um, Atari would own all of that technology. Somehow knowledge of this um, deal made it back to Commodore. Commodore went, okay, we'll give you the half a million dollars. You can pay Atari back and that will remove the, uh, um, the obligation you have to Atari. But that was not only was my father already six months out of Commodore? He was already into Atari by the time uh, that happened. Thank you for correcting the history. Sure. Again, this is not just so what somebody said, it's a, a couple websites online that are posting this as a timeline. So those are the same thing. <laughs> uh, most of what's on the web uh, is just the written form yeah. of. This is what somebody said. What did your dad think about doing shows like Computer Chronicles? Did he see it just as part of the business showing up and marketing it? Or did he enjoy those public appearances? Yes and no. Um, he recognized that they were useful. Um, and that there, there were an opportunity to, to give a positive presentation. 
Um, he he wished they weren't necessary. Uh, but uh, yeah, and he didn't do a lot of them. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think I did one of those with him. Uh, one of the nice things about Computer Chronicles was uh, one of the main guys doing it was uh, Gary Kildall, uh, who was pretty important to, uh, uh, to the personal computer industry uh, and had worked quite closely with um, Atari and was you know, just all around a great guy. So before I open it up um, to some questions, I'd like to ask a few more. Um, Please. Uh, uh, so you go to Atari in 84, right? Yep. Um, what is your understanding of what you're going to be doing there? And what was your kind of experience? <laughs> My experience uh, was non-existent. Uh, I, I knew about computers, you know, starting with, uh, you know, that uh, you know, junior high experience with uh, uh, Mark Sense cards and of a, uh, a Kim one, learned a lot uh, with the Commodore PET. You know, I was on part of the very small team that developed the PET. Did a lot of computer work, you know, work on computers um, to get my uh, PhD in physics and uh, went from graduate student to VP of software um, in a month. And what I was going to do was anything and, any, and everything that I possibly could to make this company successful. Dad wasn't, uh, Dad wasn't big on titles. Well, VPS software, were you focused on certain systems or? So um, the company existed as far as we were concerned at the beginning, the company existed to bring out this new computer, the Atari ST. And uh, exactly what the software in it at the time was not well-defined. Uh, we uh, fairly shortly uh, went to the, the only two companies that, so we, we knew immediately, you know, from the start that we could not assemble a team to develop and, or to design, develop, debug, and implement a cutting edge operating system in, did, I, I mentioned that the time scales we were given were um, insane. So this was July of 84. And by January of 85, we had to have a working prototype, uh, preferably ready for production. Uh, but we had to have a working demonstrable prototype at CES. Um, and there was just no way uh, that we could possibly do that if we had to write our own operating system. So the first thing we did is we went to Microsoft and talked to them about Windows. Um, we were told that if the uh, machine was based on an Intel processor, then it was possible that we could get it by um, in time for January 1985 delivery. Uh, but we had settled on a Motorola 68000 for various reasons that some of which were valid and some of which historically and now look like they were wrong, but technologically, I think they were still right. Um, so Microsoft said, we can't do it on a 68000. We went to uh, digital research. They said they could, and um, that's what we did. But we, when I started, we didn't know what the machine was going to be um, other than we wanted it to be inexpensive and easy to use and very powerful. When did the term Jack and Tosh appear and how do you feel about that? I think it appeared just after that CES when the machine was, so it was either either just after or just before if, if some of the, the details 
got out. Um, I had my head so deeply buried in technical details and administrivia trying to get this thing done um, that I would I did not notice I I didn't notice most of anything outside of the uh, the details of my job. Did you attend the CES of the unveiling? I presume. Oh yeah. In oh Vegas? absolutely. And oh absolutely. There, and and kind of delving into the machine a little bit. What did you have any like fingers crossed? Hope the bug doesn't show up or. No, every, that... ev everything that we so the machine was not done. There was one custom chip um, that didn't work. Uh, so the machine did not have that functionality. Um, that was the um, basically the DMA and floppy disk controller. And um, so all the software is in ROM, including the applications, uh, but everything else worked. Um, and the version of, uh, of of Jam that was on there in in TOS the operating system uh, and Logo and Basic and a couple of other pieces of software they all worked so we weren't worried about anything the the main thing was would these prototype um, chips some of which uh, the first versions we had gotten were you know a month or so old. Um, would they work under the lights on for you know 10 hours a day uh that was the issue it wasn't a question of of uh of bugs the the funniest thing that happened was there was a a writer at one of the computer magazines that was convinced that this demo was fake uh, that somewhere in the back of the booth, there was a, I don't know, a deck mini computer or something that was generating this and um, would read the, the keyboard stuff that we were doing and, and display, but the, the box was just a shell and had nothing in it. Uh, so what we did was find a, a plug uh, an electrical outlet in the middle of the floor, unscrewed the cap, took a lamp, plugged it in to prove that this was in fact a 120 volt plug, grabbed the, the a machine, plugged it in and ran it. So there was no way it could be faked. Uh, of course, these days you could do it through Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi did not exist at the time. Um, but yeah, that was... Uh, CS was fun. Uh, lots of questions, lots of excitement, lots of, oh my God, how could you have done this? And you gotta be kidding, you did this in six months, that's impossible. And we said, yeah, we thought so too, uh, but, but we managed. How hard was it for dad to be away from Commodore as he's enjoying the success of Atari and seeing you know, um, these new machines and um, or was it just an afterthought? He never talked about it. He never talked about Commodore unless the subject came up and then he uh, uh, steered it away uh, as quickly as possible. Was not of, was of no interest. As far as he was concerned, he was not. So the, the Commodore of the time um, was not the Commodore that he knew. It was, uh, so, you know, every time I hear someone talk about a Commodore Amiga, um, I, I, I have mental whiplash. Uh, there was no Amiga at Commodore. Commodore has nothing to do with Amiga and Amiga has nothing to do with Commodore as far as my head is concerned. Um, but, uh, and, and dad was much the same way. Uh, but the, you know, any, this any thoughts about Commodore were all in the past and with no interest in in the uh, in the state of it of the company after he left. What are your thoughts about all this retro mania? And I guess uh, what would your dad think about you know uh, the legacy that he's left? Are you surprised at how popular the Commodore is? 
Well, yeah. when you're the first computer brand to sell a million, more than a million machines of one model. And I think, you know, up until quite recently, um, the Commodore 64 was the largest selling single model computer ever. Yes. Um, you can't help but leave a legacy. Um, I think it's wonderful. I'm, I'm glad that uh, Commodore was, uh, was able to provide a, uh, a, a fertile ground to produce people that were needed for the industry when the industry needed those people. Um, I was asked a while ago um, what I thought was Commodore's biggest contribution uh, to the personal computer business. Um, and you know, it's clear that if Commodore had never existed or if Commodore had never gone into the computer business, that personal computers were gonna be a thing anyway. Uh, Commodore did not create the personal computer. Um, uh, was you know, certainly part of it, but if Commodore weren't there, personal computers would be anyway. But because of my father's relentless drive to make them affordable and to get them to as many people as possible, he really saw them as a, uh, an opportunity to democratize information and to be uh, an, an, an necessary for uh, modern technology. Uh, because they were cheap, sorry, inexpensive, um, they were accessible. So when the business flourished and the industry needed people that were familiar with and capable of operating these, these machines, because of Commodore, those people were available. Uh, I think that's the real legacy. And he was pretty happy about that. Do you have any of the models? Um, I've got two pets, one with an original chiclet keyboard um, and the other not. I have the SX64 that I wrote my PhD thesis on using um, Paperclip 64 software. Um, and I have an Atari TT um, and I have an Atari Jaguar. Um, none of them have been turned on in at least a decade. I also have a couple of calculators, including the, uh, uh, the first one that I wrote the, uh, the firmware for. And um, have you been able to pass on any of these uh, to the new generation of Tremels? I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, well, no, they're they're, 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 they're they're all in my basement. <laughs> okay. um, I'm, I, I suspect that uh, uh, that at least one of my kids will uh, will think those they're they're cool and, and want to have them. Uh, but uh, no, I've I'm, I'm keeping them. There yeah. were uh, there are a few things that uh, I have given to the Computer History Museum um, because. Uh, I, I thought that they were they were good to have. Um, the machines that I just mentioned uh, were all too common for the Computer History Museum to need um, duplicates of. Uh, in fact, if you go to the Computer History Museum website, at least last time I looked at this, um, they talk about uh, the computer about the museum taking donations but they don't want donations of Commodore 64s because they have far too many of them. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and they, they had several pets. Uh, I, I did a talk for last year's um, Vintage Computer Festival West where I talked about the, uh, uh, the, the wonderful twisted path of finding the original wooden pet prototype that we had worked on. 
Um, it turned out it was in the Computer History Museum collection, but they didn't know it. It had mm -hmm. been miscatalogued, um, but we, uh, uh, we straightened that out. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to open up uh, questions uh, from our members here. Is that okay, Leonard? Please. Yeah, okay. Um, who, anybody like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I, I, I see several people with hand with electronic hands up and physical hands up, and there are some questions in the chat. So go yeah, for it, Nika. I, I have a couple. Is that uh, sorry if I go first? Go ahead. I, um, so for, first of all, I just want to say my sister actually worked at Commodore. Uh, she was um, Kit Spencer's secretary for a couple of years in the early 80s. She knew your dad. Okay. Uh, it's just uh, Kit's, Kit's a wonderful human being. Yes. He, I, he, my sister told me a lot of good things about him. Um, so Commodore is definitely in my blood. Uh, my sister gave me a VIC-20 when I was a young teenager. And uh, so anyway, uh, so I was two common key points in uh, the computer history in Commodore that we've heard stories about. I'd like you to give you your clarification or, or confirmation on. Um, first, it's been said that when uh, Chuck Peddle wanted to make the pet that your dad got your input, he wasn't interested in computers and you had to kind of convince him or check out Chuck and make sure, I don't know. I mean, the story was your dad didn't really care about computers. And so, um, you know, how did that yeah, come so, about? Um, so that's, well, I was that's say, basically quick, I'll correct. Tell you, I'll tell you my second Please. question and you can go with both of them and I'll, I'll shut up after that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. When the, the, uh, uh, Chuck, the, the danger is, of course, I'll forget the second by the time I'm finished ask, answering the first it's, but it's not too complicated it's when when okay. uh it's apparently the vic 20 your dad wanted to make the vic chuck didn't like that he wanted to make business machines and chuck kind of stormed off that's the general gist so if you could address those two point time points in common that'd be cool okay um so uh commodore was making electronic calculators all of their calculators or most of their calculators um, were based on TI chips. Texas Instrument decided that they would get into the calculator business and in the process um, set up a, uh, a business environment that drove multi-billion dollar companies instantly out of business. Um, those of us old enough to remember Bomar, huge calculator company, basically died overnight as a result of this action by um, TI. Uh, my dad's reaction uh, as a Holocaust survivor was, I don't die that easily. And he found MOS Technology, which was um, the supplier of most of the other chips that Commodore used. And Oh, uh, and he became enamored with the concept of vertical integration, having all of the material that you needed to be successful under your control, or at least uh, to make sure that no one could hold you hostage. Uh, so MOS technology was purchased in uh, far from the first and far from the last of the uh, positively amazing business deals that um, dad was involved in. And um, shortly after Commodore bought the company, he invited to, um, to his office to speak to, or the conference room, because he didn't have an office there yet, um, to speak to everyone in charge of the different projects that were going on. And one of them was Chuck Pedal, who was in charge of this thing called a microprocessor. Um, it had some, some numbers associated with it, which dad did not remember at the time. And Chuck told him, I want to make a personal computer. And in order to do that, uh, no, I want to make a personal computer. I'm going to do it whether... I do it for Commodore or not. 
If you want, if you want Commodore to do it, I'll do it for you. If you don't, I'll leave and I'll do it on my own. And dad came home um, and he told this story at the 25th anniversary of the Commodore 64 um, event at the Computer History Museum. Um, he, uh, so dad came home um, and said, this guy's got this idea. I don't know what to make of it. Uh, could you please come and talk to him and tell me whether or not his idea makes any sense? Uh, so I went to this embedded microcontroller conference down in Southern California somewhere uh, with dad, had one of the strangest discussions in the history of humanity, where um, we spent the first 45 minutes, hour, something like that, talking about science fiction stories. Um, Chuck was enamored with this story by Robert Heinlein called The Door into Summer, which is a time travel story where um, the hero travels into the future, into a world of ubiquitous computing where everything has a computer in it. And he wanted to live in that world. And to live in that world, people need to be comfortable with computers and robots. To be comfortable with robots, they need to be comfortable with the computers. To be comfortable with computers, you needed to have a really low cost processor to make computers for people to get into. So he developed the 6502 with that goal in mind. The first step was done, the 6502 was done, it was time to make the computer. Um, after the discussion with Chuck and what a fantastic evangelizer Chuck was, um, I came back and told, uh, told dad, yep, sounds like a good idea. Uh, so uh, dad said to Chuck, yep, great, go do it. Um, and by the way, you have to have it done in, I think it was six months. Um, and somehow we got it done. Um, and the second question, uh, there was some disagreement about what the next computer that Commodore should work on after the PET. Um, so the PET was a horrible, um, what's called a backronym. It was a uh, pet as in like the pet rock and is a friendly thing. And somebody, our marketing, advertising, sales guy at the time uh, came up with the horrible backronym of personal electronic transactor. Um, and the question was, what was the next machine going to be? Uh, Chuck wanted to have a toy. Uh, so another backronym. Uh, toy in this case was spelt T-O-I for the other intellect, uh, which was a business machine that Chuck wanted to make. Um, and dad saw from his information about Japan that there were going to be a bunch of low cost, high performance uh, computing devices for the home that he wanted to make sure because he knew this was going to be a big market because if the Japanese were going to go into it, it was going to be a, a big market. So he wanted to go and, and do that. Um, and when um, a semiconductor engineer at MOS by the name of Bob Yanis produced a uh, cute little box um, called the MicroPet, it was just a little bit bigger than the chiclet keyboard on the original PET. Um, the keyboard didn't actually do much because it was just a bunch of canned demos. But you plug this into a, uh, into a TV and it produced graphics and color and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and this was, uh, this was first shown in private um, at a, I guess it was the 1981? Uh, maybe 1980 Consumer Electronics Show. I was at um, I was in at Columbia in graduate school. Dad called, said, "I need your advice on something. Come to CES and take a look at this." And we uh, 
we saw this, you know, talked about it. Uh, that was where I first met uh, Mike Tomchek, um, who was uh, completely clueless about what any of these machines or anything did. Um, had no idea why anyone would want to do such a thing and was completely confused about what VIC stood for. Um, but uh, when the decision went ahead to make the VIC-20, uh, Chuck left and started uh, serious computers to make what he thought was going to be a, you know, game-changing business machine. Uh, didn't work out that way. That was, that was a long answer for- Perfect, no, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome, Chris. What do you want to do next, Dave? Dave, uh, uh, Nico, anybody? Yeah ben, yeah, ben has a question and Marius. Okay. Yeah, hi, uh, hi, Ben. Leonard, hi, pleasure, honor to meet you on Zoom. Anyway, not in person. Yeah, you're 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 a very lovely looking rectangle there. Oh, you like my background? You guys got a lot of a lot of personal history going on here. Um, yeah, so just uh, I, I actually worked for a very short period of time at Commodore Canada. Uh, okay. 1990, 91, give or take. I was a kid. I'm 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 49 now. So um, I was in high school. Worked there as a co-op student, and. Um, that's that's really what my question is about. Is that is where that, where uh, what what office? Canada, Toronto. Where, where was what was the address? Pharmacy on pharmacy. Okay, the one on pharmacy. All right. Okay. Well, that was my question. Is 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 uh, there's a lot of talk that this is the Toronto Pet User Group. So a lot of us here are in Toronto, Canada, or nearby. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of history, like or, or talk about history, the connection with Canada and Toronto. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I sort of heard rumors that one of the first Commodore offices was in downtown Toronto. And uh, but I've never really heard the true story behind that, which, of course, you would know better than anybody. So what is the connection with Toronto? Well, I, I actually wouldn't know that better than anybody, oh, really? um, because when Commodore. So Commodore was founded in 1959 or eight. Um, and I was born in 1954. Uh, so I didn't have a lot to do with it. Uh, I mean, I may have been, I may have been a bright kid, but no. <laughs> not at four years old. <laughs> uh, not at four or five years old. Not a, not a chance. Um, probably the best uh, introduction to that that I can think of is a recent talk uh, uh, by someone else on the screen here. Uh, Dave uh, gave at the uh, VCF East um, recently uh, that I just watched a couple of days ago, um, who goes into amazing detail uh, about the history of Commodore. And yes, uh, Commodore began as a Canadian company in Toronto. Uh, I guess, were you here? Were you born here? I was born in New York. Okay. Um, when I was six months old, we moved to Toronto. Okay. Um, and uh, Dave might be interested. There was a, a little uh, thing that he mentioned in his talk. Um, so I, interestingly enough, I have no personal memories prior to the third grade. Um, I don't remember anything personally uh, prior to being eight years old. Uh, but we have pictures. And I remember, and, you know, and people talked about it uh, after I was eight. So we lived at two different places in um, Toronto between when I was six months old, which is when we moved to Toronto to when I was five when we moved back to the New York area. We uh, lived at four Wingreen Court and six Pinemore, both in Don Mills, um, a, uh, basically a suburb of, uh, of Toronto. I, I, I'm now a, a real estate agent in Toronto, so I'm pretty familiar with the geography around here. But yep. uh, Four Windgreen, what was the other? Yeah, four I, four uh, yeah. um, Pinemore. Which number? Six. Six Pinemore. And, and I remember it was Court or Crescent or something like that. But it was uh, fine. Uh, six Pinemore. Crescent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure about which it was. 
<laughs> but um, yeah, that was uh, that. That's when the that's when Commodore, as it eventually morphed, uh, began. And do you have any photos? You said something before. Do you have any photos of those times of that office or the building or anything like that? Any? No, these are all family photos of you know the the wife and kids and grandparents and stuff. Oh, okay. And and then so and and then your dad and you moved to New York eventually. And uh, what year would that? Be yeah. Around? So when when I was five, we moved to uh, Baldwin, um, which is on Long Island, mm -hmm. and. Uh, then we moved back to Toronto when I was um, 15. Okay. No, when, when I was, uh, so when I was 10, so five to, to 10 in uh, New York, 10 to 15 back in Toronto, where we lived uh, at Fifeshire, uh, 25 okay. Fifeshire, right near the corner of York Mills and Bayview. That address sounds very familiar, suspiciously. <laughs> I wonder if you recently sold it. I, I, well, um, I, did, I didn't sell, but I think I know. I think I know somebody might have lived there or something. But yeah, right. Check. Well, yeah. now, now you know somebody else. <laughs> and um, and so you're, um, you're here for high school. Your part of your high school was here. Yeah. Um, so when I was so I. I so one of the problems, of course, is the, the difference in nomenclature, high school, junior high school, middle school, right, 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 um, right. Is, you know, ninth grade in Ontario at the time was not part of high school because high school went from grade 10 to 13. Right. Um, right. So that is a little weird. Mm. Uh, so we're in Toronto and dad is doing an amazing amount of, of business in the Far East. Uh, so we moved to California uh, to cut six hours off the, the, um, the, the flight. flight. Yeah. <laughs> and we moved to uh, a town um, in California called Watsonville, where we lived on this, this lovely um, thing, uh, call it the JT Ranch, um, where the nearest neighbor was a quarter of a mile away down the driveway. And mom hated it. You know, it was, it was beautiful and all that. But when the kids were at school and dad was on a business trip, she's all alone with the cows. Um, and after a year, she insisted that we move back to Toronto. <laughs> uh, so we did. Uh, we moved back to, oh, I'm trying to remember the address. We only lived there for a year. Um, it was uh, in a condo development um, at the corner of York Mills and Bayview. Um, so I think we lived like 20 Sunshine Mill Way or something like that. Um, and the first time it snowed after living in California for a year, <laughs> mom is going, what did I do? <laughs> um, so we moved back to California the next year, um, but to the uh, Santa Clara Valley, you know, what is now called Silicon Valley, uh, where the neighbors were closer and, and that was better. And I say that every time it snows here, why am I here? <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I can understand that. It was worse back in the mid sixties when, when we were doing that. The first, the first night we spent at um, 25 Fiveshire um, was in the early spring and the power went out. I think there was like six inches of freezing rain and <laughs> snow fell. Uh, great introduction to living in Toronto for five years. All right. Well, thank you. That's a, that was. You're welcome. Curious about the the Canadian slash Toronto connection. Oh yeah. One last thing. You you, you said when I said I asked that I worked there for a short period of time. You said which location? I said pharmacy. Right. Was was there a build? Was there a location before pharmacy? Yeah, there there was. Um, darn, I, the 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 address has fallen on my head. Uh, Dave, you remember? Nine forty six Warden Avenue in Scarborough. Yeah, that's the one. Yep, the one in Scarborough. Yeah, um, yeah, and and of course you you said you worked there in the in the nineties. 
Yeah, um, like like a, maybe eighty nine. When when it was you know no longer the Commodore that I that no, I knew. Yeah, I mean I I mean I was and I was about probably sixteen you know seventeen years old. It was I was working there as a co op student as a part of. The Are you trying to make me feel old? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, not. To... <laughs> it's all right. I'm Please. comfortable with it. I. I've had a couple of decades now of my uh, kids telling me that I'm old as dirt. <laughs> I, truthfully, I was never, I wasn't really paid to work as a co-op student. What happened was they did pay me when I helped out at, at, at World of Commodore and other events. When I went to events, right. the office, they, they did pay me for that. But I was, I was just, I was just happy to be there and hang out and part of it. And there's actually, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a video I put on YouTube. I made a, for my co-op class, it was intended for eight other kids and one teacher to see it. I made a video uh, of my of a tour of Commodore in uh, 19 Canada headquarters in 1991. Oh, cool! I'll and look I, for it. And uh, and if you just if you uh, Google my name or YouTube my name or just Google Commodore Canada 1991 on YouTube, you'll see it's about like 30 minutes of me just walking around with a camcorder. It's not very good. It was all, which really meant for eight kids and one teacher to see, and now it's like a hundred thousand views on YouTube, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, who's next, Nico? Thank you. Um, if I can. Uh, hi, Leonard. Uh, my name is Mariusz, uh, and I live currently in Poland. Uh, I received my first Atari in late eighties. That was before we switched from socialism to democracy in nineteen nineteen. Uh, so Atari was a big thing uh, for me, for sure. It has shaped me uh, to who I am today. That's the rare opportunity to say thank you. Uh, you're and you're the most question, welcome. <laughs> and the question is, your father was also born in Poland. Uh, I know that it was so long time ago, uh, but uh, did he teach you anything uh, about Polish language? Do you remember anything about Polish or not at all? So it's, it's, it's actually kind of funny. Um, I, I mentioned at the beginning that I, I said my parents were illiterate in three languages. Um, one of the things that my parents did uh, was if they wanted to talk to each other and not have the kids understand, they would speak Yiddish. But they did this when I was young enough that I picked it up. Um, so one day when I was like six or seven, they said something that I just could not let stand. And, and I chimed in, um, at which point they switched to Polish. And I was already too old to pick up the language from, you know, little bits and pieces. So I never learned Polish. Um, you also have to remember that um, they were Jewish. And being Jewish in Poland, um, especially in the 20s, 30s, and 40s um, was, was not a good thing. Uh, so they did not have a lot of uh, positive things uh, in their memories about Poland. Uh, we did go back as a family um, in 1984, no, not, uh, 2004, for the 60th anniversary of the clearing of the Lodge Ghetto. Um, and where we saw the apartment building that dad lived in, um, the site of um, the building that my mom lived in. Uh, they did not meet uh, until after the war, even though they were in the same ghetto um, and apparently lived next door to each other, um, according to the records that exist. Um, but their memories of Poland, except for very family-centric things were all very, very negative. Yeah, I hope it has changed it. <laughs> uh, we, we had a fine time back in Poland. Um, with, uh, with Atari, we had some very good uh, representation in Poland. Uh, one of the people that we did a lot of work with uh, came to the US, uh, lots, of, lots of good stuff. Yeah, it has shaped uh, all the um, computer communi community in Poland uh, when we received and can, could use Atari and Commodore. So, yeah, yeah, the uh, the the ability for people to communicate um, and to uh, have a a non government regulated uh, access to information 
um, through personal computers was something that my father was uh, was very glad to uh, to be helpful in. I'm yeah, glad it was, was something. good for you as well. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much for the answer. Thanks, Marius. Uh, we've got uh, David. You got your hand up. Would you like? Hi, Dave. Hello. Hello. I'm in my my own little world of Commodore here. I see. I, I, I went to gather. I've been collecting a long time. I went to gather my pets. I had no idea. I thought there <laughs> were 32, and then I found seven more in the garage. I haven't been able to get out. Oh, my anyway, gosh. I was just curious. Um, uh, well, little by little, I'll get rid of them. But none will get scrapped. Not one key. Um, <laughs> I was curious. The time you were in Toronto, and the various times you are in Toronto, what school did you go to? Um, Owen Boulevard Public School, when oh, I yeah. lived at 25 Fife Shire, and um, York Mills Collegiate Institute, when I lived uh, on Station yes. Railway. Yes, I, I have worked in the Toronto District School Board for a long time, never at those schools, but I've been there around yep. and around. Oh, sorry, my cat is just kind of, okay, thank you, Penny. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I will let others ask questions, I'm just... Uh, I know we're friends on Facebook, but we've never communicated, and it's good to see you. And I did everything I could to get as many people to come to witness this history. Well, there's, a, there's a lot of people on the screen, so that's great. All right. Onward to the next. Who's next, Nico? Who's next? Hi. I don't know if uh, I can go. Yes, please. Okay. Hi. So first, uh, greetings to all from uh, Mexico City. So um, I've lived here all my life, and uh, I just want to first thank you for the, the work that you did. Uh, I was very impacted by Atari computers specifically. My first one was before your father's Sierra because it was an 800 XL. And then I got a 130 XE, and then an ST, a 520 ST just after it came out that really changed my life. And it was really hard to get in Mexico because back then there was no NAFTA. We had to go through all kinds of hoops to import it into Mexico, and uh, I'll always thank my father for doing that for me. I am uh, very interested in your take on the on the history of Atari, specifically because I was rooting so hard for you guys, and I, I think that the the ST really was an extraordinary achievement in power for the price, obviously. And uh, I remember using it and loving it and thinking it was so much better than IBM PCs and all the other computers that my friends have. So I'm very interested in your take on, uh, on what happened. On, on, I mean, there's a lot of information out there, but I'm very interested on your personal take about uh, what would an alternate universe have looked like where, uh, where Atari would still be with us today. Thank well, you. I don't know. I don't know if there's one where Atari would still be with us today. That's a, that's a long time. But one where Atari succeeded more in the computer in the, in the computer business than we did, I think would have to have um, corrected what I think of as two mistakes, um, big mistakes that we made. Uh, one was underestimating the power and importance of the phrase, no one was ever fired for buying IBM. The um, firm entrenchment of IBM in the business world was a really big thing to overcome. And uh, trying to fight against um, the incredible foothold into the business mind that the IBM PC had was hard. Um, and the other was Atari and maybe mostly my dad, but I think all of us did not understand the realities of working with third-party developers and how to do that best. Um, so we did not nurture the um, third party software, didn't have as much support for that um, as we could. 
um, and certainly as much as we should. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, there was room for more than one alternative um, to the PC uh, and the one that, that made it was the Mac. Um, and that made it mostly by having huge amounts of money to, um, to market like hell. Uh, Apple generated this impression that people assumed was true because they heard it over and over and over again, that if you were creative, if you were innovative, you needed to use a Mac. Um, and for a short time, the, uh, the, the Mac OS was infinitely better than Windows. And that, that helped them get a good foothold. Um, it wasn't really significantly better uh, from a user experience point of view, uh, certainly, um, than the operating system on the SD. Uh, their developer support was better than ours. And, but I, I don't think that there was enough flexibility in the market for, to, for there to be two um, things that, that bucked the, uh, the power of the uh, IBM PC compatible. Um, but, so I'm not sure that any alternate reality would, would actually have made us more successful unless we managed to dethrone Apple. One of the things that I really wish we had done um, early in 1986, um, I had the idea that we should make a, uh, a TV commercial where someone is drawing on a computer an Apple logo, which at the time was color, um, on, in a paint program on an Atari ST, and point out that the only computer you could do this on was from Atari, not Apple. Um, I, don't, I don't think that would have made all the difference. Uh, but it would have been fun. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned before that you approached uh, Microsoft before digital research for the, I guess, for the operating system for the machine. Uh -huh. I think I think that's interesting. Um, do you think that would have made a difference? And final question. You yes, it would have made the machine. Yeah, it would have made the machine tremendously inferior. Yeah. Um, Gem was <laughs> okay. much better than Windows. Okay, and. Uh, and in Europe, you had a lot more success, right? So um, what do you attribute that for? And then I don't know if this is true, but uh, some stories say that at the end of the story, of the ST story and the Atari story, part of the problem was the, the differences between Atari UK and Atari Germany and how to market the machine. So uh, your thoughts on that, please. And uh, that would be it for me. Thank you so much. Um, I, I don't think that the differences between Atari UK and Atari Germany were were all that important for the, the success of the company. I think we had a had more success in Europe than in the US um, because um, Commodore and therefore my father had more uh, channels available to him um, in, uh, in Europe. And IBM, as international as they, were was still primarily a US company and they did most and they concentrated most of their of their efforts um, on uh, on the US so the, uh, the the PC did not make the uh, the huge inroads that we had to overcome uh, in the US uh, they, they weren't as significant um, in Europe thank you thank you so much yep what was the extent of in what was the extent of interaction with your father and uh, Bill Gates from what you understand what was their relationship like I'm sure they met at least once um, there I, I don't I don't I, I do not remember him ever mentioning Bill um, I met him a few times. 
Uh, there was never much, uh, I mean, Microsoft was a big company and there was, uh, there was lots of, uh, of other people that did things. Uh, uh, Commodore uh, or Atari was never a, uh, an important thing uh, in the world of Microsoft. Uh, what are your what are you doing at SETI now? Uh, so I'm uh, a member of what's called their Council of Advisors. Um, so I uh, I advise. Uh, I'm been I've been very active in science communication and science education. Uh, so I'm helping uh, in in that realm. Hey, Leonard. Uh, um, nice to see you again. Uh, I have a quick, uh, an, a rather strange question, perhaps. Uh, and and you, you mentioned several times about Sinclair and um, some of the work you did from the personal computer perspective to kind of uh, not let not them not them not let them succeed, or or at least so you could be a good competitor against them. But one of the things that um, I'm curious about if is. Before before the computers, you were doing calculators, and you had a, such an extraordinarily large spectrum of calculators. Some of them a little bit esoteric, and Sinclair was out there too, also as a big calculator uh, producer, also producing a lot of esoteric things. You know, you you had the, for instance, the um, the pilot's calculator. Sinclair had things like betting calculators. I'm just curious whether at that point in time you were crossing swords and do you have any memory of like kind of the wackiness of some of these calculators and why you were producing them? Was there, was there a market or like <laughs> any, well, any I wrote, I wrote, I wrote the software for at least one of those. Um, there was a, uh, um, I'm trying to remember the model number SR 9190 or something like that. Um, that had all, all sorts of bizarre could someone um, mute Bob bit. there found your blade after you <laughs> sharpen it got my advice here thanks um so the uh um so the calculator had gamma functions and standard and, and polar rectangle, polar rectangle coordinates are actually relatively common, but all sorts of bizarre things in it um, because we could. And uh, every, we had a, a navigator pilot, a statistician, uh, all sorts of, of esoteric calculators. And they weren't all that expensive to produce. They weren't all that difficult. It just required um, some small changes to the keyboard and a different ROM and uh, having your own micro micro codable uh, processor allowed you to do that and uh, they, they sold reasonably well and they were uh, they were a good marketing tool to say you know we can do this for this group we can do something for you uh, there wasn't a lot of um, as far as I knew at the time, uh, there wasn't a lot of friction between Sinclair and Commodore uh, then. Uh, shortly thereafter, I uh, um, went to graduate school and sort of fell out of the, uh, of the computer world. Uh, and whether or not there was any more uh, after that, I, I really don't know. Uh, I think I've, I've never formally met um, Sir, Sir Clive, uh, but at the CES where the MicroPet was first shown um, in private, the exterior walls of our booth, uh, of the interior meeting rooms of the booth, were heavily tinted plexiglass. So if you cupped your hands and peered through, you could faintly see what was going on inside the meeting rooms. And one time I turn around and there's this very dapper gentleman um, with a, an umbrella looking very British, who I was told was Sir Clive, who was peeking in at our, at our micro pet. 
Um, that may have been the closest I ever been to him. If I could just but, uh, follow up with um, a completely different quick question. You mentioned it could be the History Museum and and um, some of the things you've donated. Uh, I think we've talked before a little bit about their 500-year plan. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I actually feel a little stressed about this, that there seems to be a lot of great artifacts that are going into deep storage that may not even be that relevant in 500 years, but are not available for people to see today. Um, and do, what what are your thoughts about this trade-off um, that some of these institutions are making? I, I am not an expert in that field. Um, I, I definitely feel the trade-off. Um, I definitely see the advantages to both uh, things. I must say that personally, I was very disappointed that shortly after we found the, uh, the original wooden pet that we didn't get the opportunity to display it um, at VCF West. Um, I, I might spend some more time uh, in the next couple of months trying to uh, fix that for this year's VCS West. There which, isn't uh, going to, but, but uh, this is uh, not if you're aware, um, this is part of the disappointment too. VCF West is probably not going to be happening or it's not going to be at the computer oh, history here. team because uh, it seems that every weekend they've assigned to a church group. So uh, it, the facility can't be used for um, computing history, which is, seems oh, to be a crime to me. So, Let, Leonard, I wanted to talk to you about that offline. Uh, help me convince Eric to do just a Friday, Saturday. Um. Let, let me know who to talk to. All right, Eric. Can I also propose, uh, Leonard, that uh, VCF Midwest uh, be a well, potential it, host? It's going to be awfully hard to convince the Computer History Museum to let that artifact out of its hands. Okay. And I don't well, blame him. It's a, it, it's a pretty think, delicate thing. I think there's also um, a need for, there's a lot of people getting all, older with, with some quite important artifacts that may need to reconsider whether they should donate to the Computer History Museum, because quite frankly, um, I'm not really sure what they're doing for computer history nowadays, uh, at least for the current generation. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, I think there's a number of older people are now concerned that if they give their artifacts to Computer History Museum, they're never going to see the light of day again. Right. Uh, Leonard, if I could go next, perhaps. I just I I understand you were involved in the design of the pet ski graphics of, on that original pet. Yeah, uh, as yeah. in I I did that myself. Okay, got it. Yeah, so the internet was accurate is more what I was asking on that. I'm just wondering that, if that you does remember... occasionally happen. <laughs> um, in that context, like how did you come to be involved with that and? Do you remember anything about doing the designs? Were there certain trade-offs you made? Perhaps there's, oh, if we could only have added this or that. And yeah, I'm just kind of curious on if, you know, some of the trade-offs you made, if you remember some of the, I don't know, well, graphics as, that as were left the, off. Yeah, so as the, uh, the least skilled um, member of the team, uh, I was handed the uh, sort of, yeah, someone's got to do this. I don't know who job of designing the character set. Uh, so Chuck Peddle said, this is how the graphics works. So we have 128 characters um, that will get, mirror, uh, will get uh, bit flipped to light and dark. So uh, 64 base characters. We wanna be able to draw stuff and it needs to be usable over a huge range of topics. The only thing that I'm going to insist on are hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs, because I want to play blackjack. And um, we want a pi symbol because pi is important in mathematics. Uh, that was it. Those were the instructions. And um, I spent... I do not remember how long, but a lot of time 
and a lot of graph paper, um, playing around with different things, just trying to figure out what sort of what sort of things were going to be possible, what sort of things could be um, realized more easily because the characters existed. Uh, so there are uh, bar graph characters that allow you to get any width of a graph one, ca one character high and one with arbitrary width at a pixel level and um, vertical bars one character wide with any height at the pixel level. That ate up a lot of characters. Um, and I wanted to be able to draw boxes. So we have um, rounded edges. Uh, rounded corners and square corners. Uh, one of the things that I'd love to to be able to, you know, build a time machine and you know sit in on meetings. Uh, there were meetings um, into what determined. Um, I'm trying to remember the number. Uh, there's an ANSI standard for what became the character set in the IBM PC. They have a bunch of um, they call them box drawing characters, which look an awful lot like the ones I designed. I'm wondering how much of that is parallel evolution and how much of that is, oh, this is what Commodore did. Let's, let's use that. Uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I think it worked out well. There were a couple of, of things I wish we had thought of. Um, in particular, uh, the upper lower case um, functionality of later revisions of the OS kicked out a bunch of characters that um, wound up sort of fracturing the, the character set. So there were things that you couldn't do with the, uh, with, when lowercase was uh, involved. And if we had been more careful about how we rearranged, how we arranged those characters, it would have been a little bit more flexible. Uh, so we, we, we were far from perfect, but I think we did a good job. Uh, by we, I mean me. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. And at that point in time, do you recall any discussions of, you know, is there a way, because it's a fixed ROM in, in that original pet, like you, you, you can't sort of point a pointer to a set of RAM and, you know, modify that. Was there any discussions at all at the hardware level of, Trying to make oh that yeah it was, it was it was just, it was just too hard to do okay. um, it would require um, uh, uh, it would require basically as much memory as it was in the machine uh, it was in you know it was the the first first machine was designed to be an eight k machine um, and to have that much RAM and it would have to be dual ported um, so you could get to it from the processor and from the video controller. Um, that was, that was just undoable. Got it. Bill's Thank nodding. you very much. Bill's nodding. Uh, do, do I have the hardware right, Bill? Yes, you have the hardware right. Yeah. I'm, I'm nodding subconsciously even. <laughs> okay. I think, um, We've, you know, gotten through all the questions we needed. Um, Leonard, thank you. Oh, so I, I, much. I think there's at, there's at least one more. One I more? think okay. Dave. I think Dave Murtry has a question. I would love to ask a question, Leonard. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, your father's birthday is a bit of a mystery to me. I believe it's December thirteenth, nineteen twenty-eight. His army induction papers said it was September thirteenth, nineteen twenty-seven. His visa application said it was December thirteenth, nineteen twenty-seven. And he told Dun and Bradstreet it was 1929. So if you could confirm what it actually was, and uh, maybe tell the story about why there's so much confusion about such a simple thing. So I have no idea where the Dun and Bradstreet number came from. That that could have just been as simple as a brain fart. Um, I've never heard this September uh, date. Um, the actual date was December 13th, 1928. Um, but officially, in his visa application, in his um, citizenship papers, and all that, it's December 13th, 1927. 
And the reason is actually very simple. He was talking to either an army or an immigration official um, in Germany about going to the US. And uh, the first question the officer had was, how old are you? And my father's response was, how old do I need to be? And instantly he was one year older because that's what he needed to be. Uh, excellent, thank you. <laughs> I'd simple. love to ask one question real quick if I could. Sure, Bill. So you, you mentioned your, your, uh, your dad's drive. Uh, so in the end, was he happy? The fact he could, you, you described that it, he never got to, you know, the target. There was no target. Right. Um, I think so. Yeah, he, uh, the, I mean, he had some health problems at the, uh, uh, the end of his life, um, which, you know, obviously if you, your life's ending, there are, there are health problems at all. Right. Um, but uh, he, he loved life. He, uh, he was basically a pretty happy guy. Um, there, were, there were some things he didn't like, some things that really got to him. He, uh, he never overcame the emotional and psychological trauma of uh, being a Holocaust survivor. Um, one of the things that, that he did that he thought was very important was to talk to, uh, um, to school kids, to go to middle school, high school, college students and explain what the Holocaust was and what concentration camps were like and why they happened and why we must never forget. Um, and I asked him, why don't you do more of this? Um, it's so important. You think it's so important. And you do it so rarely. And he said, oh, that's simple. When I do it, I shake for a week. Uh, it, just, it just completely tore him apart um, inside. Uh, but except when he was concentrating on that sort of stuff, he was a pretty happy guy. Uh, as you know, you, you've met him, uh, yeah. pretty exuberant and yeah. uh, uh, larger than life, uh, especially for someone who was, who was you know, five, six. Um, but uh, you said yeah, he loved think, to sing. Yep, he loved to sing. That's cool. Yeah, uh, and uh, had a lovely, uh, lovely deep voice as well. Right. So, what do you use now? What do you have for a computer now? What do you use? Um, so I've got, I'm doing this on a uh, Samsung PC compatible laptop um, that I spend a significant amount of time um, running Linux on. Uh, and I have a, uh, a, a desktop PC at home that uh, I, I have whenever possible built my own machine uh, and built with an AMD processor um, because Intel gets too much business. Uh, love it. But I um, love it. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've done a bunch of stuff with Raspberry Pis, uh, oh. played around with pick processors. Uh, there, there's a lot of fun stuff that people can do. Oh, yes, absolutely. What's your flavor of Linux? Um, most of the stuff I've been doing, well, uh, on the Raspberry, it's Raspbian on the Raspberry yep. Pi. Yep. Um, I think uh, everything else currently is Ubuntu. Okay. Awesome. Although it, it doesn't really matter there. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I get it. It's not a huge deal. I mean, I'm an arch person just because I, I like to play video games. So having the most current libraries sometimes helps with that. Right. But I can understand the, the want for the stability of having very vetted packages that are in the Ubuntu series. Yeah. And, and, ha and I, I'm, uh, if, if I want to mess around with, uh, uh, with cutting edge code, I'll just write it myself. <laughs> so. 
So you still code then? Oh, yeah. What languages do you know? Um, so the stuff I've been writing in mostly, so I've done some web stuff. So that's in mostly in PHP, uh, C, C++, most of the stuff on the Pi is in Python. Um, been messing around with uh, Zig and Rust and R, uh, but not proficient or even close to fluent in any of those. Uh, and every once in a while, just so that my brain doesn't completely ossify, I will uh, uh, try to do some stuff in 6502 assembler because I still have some of the opcodes memorized. That is awesome. That is awesome. So I, I bet you're a little excited about Rust coming to the Linux kernel and being a little bit more accessible than it was before then. Yeah, it might be, it might be fun. That's awesome. Do you contribute anything to the Linux community being such a well-versed programmer? Um, well-versed, but not expert. So, so you don't I, uh, no, no FOSS I, I, then? No. Awesome. So we've it's got four exciting. more questions. To, uh, Toka Fondo, then Chris, then Ennio, and then Cyprian. And Hello, then good night. Go Hello, everyone. Uh, it, it's, it's fine. To, uh, can you hear me right now? I can. Yeah, okay. It's 2.30 a.m. here in Spain. I'm Claudio Sanchez from Canary Island of the Facebook group. Thank you for sharing your time here. Uh, thank I, you for I, staying up so late. Thank you. Uh, I like to know, uh, not a not a detailed answer. Uh, Commodore was a hundred percent of the company you your dad uh, get into, or during the time he was president of Commodore, he was also other projects, other other business than Commodore. So for all of the time dealing with you uh, with computers and sophisticated calculators it was commodore commodore was what he did okay um, thank you you know er earlier in the in his career and in his business life um there were other things uh other companies and other businesses that commodore was in but uh okay. it, it solidified pretty uh, uh pretty clearly thank you uh, another one is uh, 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 we all remember mostly uh, Commodore for the computers. Uh, we all know stories from the engineers how the computers were designed. But uh, sadly, uh, regarding the computer design, when deals have to be done to get uh, a cheaper price. Uh, for uh, any of the companies that were building things for Commodore, uh, that is that where your father went a step in and get those deals or even not uh, involved in, in that uh, way of the computer design at all? Oh, when it, when it came to anything involving money, my father was involved uh, personally and intimately. Okay, thank you. And and the, and the last one uh, to to leave others, uh, and we have dear heard here also. Uh, mm, you recently told in the group that uh, the computer that ended being the plus four series of computers was not exactly the computer that was in mind uh, to be designed. What what was the difference then? What the, what was the computer that was to be designed and wasn't the plus four. So Bill can answer this better than me, I think, but the, uh, uh, the, the basic idea for um, the C16 was to have a $50 computer. And the, um, the, the market disruption that a full powered, um, widely distributed $50 machine would have had um, in 1985 
I think is stupendous. Uh, and dad left before that um, idea uh, was firmly uh, in place and it was uh, abandoned. Uh, is that about right, Bill? You got it. Nailed it. Yay. Thank you. Thank you for your yeah. answer, both. Just one thing if they had put paperclip in the plus four, it would have done well. <laughs> if they well, had charged it... $79 for the plus four, it would have done well. Yeah. If and 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 people would have bought paperclip, um, as I did for for my PhD thesis. Neo, do you have a question? And then Cyprian. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I can. Uh, for, first of all, thank you for being here here today with us. Um, I have a quick three questions uh, because there are a lot of confusing information about uh, history of Atari Corporation. Uh, first, uh, first one is uh, looking back. Uh, was there anything that could have saved Atari in the in, I mean in the nineties? Uh, I, I think I basically answered that earlier. Um, I don't know. Uh, it was, uh, we, were, we were heading up against uh, marketing pressures that uh, were, were pretty insurmountable. Uh, and it's unclear that, I mean, no one that was in that business survived other than IBM. Uh, and the PC clone makers, and Apple, who has survived as as a very different company. Um, if Apple had uh, had remained the computer company that it was um, in the uh, in the mid '80s, uh, it wouldn't be around anymore. Uh, it it morphed into you know the producers of iPods and Apple Music and things like that, um, and has been getting back into the computers as a uh, as a, a driving force but um it, it's unclear that uh, uh that that was survivable okay the, the second question um was mr shivashivi involved in the development of the c64 if if so how uh sure shivji yeah, yeah. Sorry for the. I, I don't know. That's the... I don't know. I was okay. I was not um, intimately involved. Uh, I was not even peripherally involved in the development of the Commodore sixty four. The only input I had into anything that happened on the sixty four is there is a, a sample program in the programmer's reference guide on how to use sprites that uses um, data statements that draws a little balloon and moves it around the screen. I wrote that. That is my one and only <laughs> <Awesome>. contribution. <laughs> last, last question, a uh, quick question. Uh, uh, what might the Atari ST have such a, an architecture? I mean, different than, for example, C64. I mean, in terms of graphic capabilities or music capabilities, different direction. Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, the, the, I mean, why the, was this uh, direction chosen? To be more powerful, to be more powerful, to be more flexible, to take advantage of the superior um, technology that was available. I mean, the, the Commodore 64 was. Um, so there, there's always a, uh, a set of compromises and trade offs that you need when you're need to consider when you're designing something. Uh, you can use the most cutting edge, sophisticated, best future looking processor around when the uh, what when uh, Tremel technology was first working on its machine, we were going to use the um, National Semiconductor 32032 family because that looked like the most sophisticated future looking thing around. Um, 
but they weren't progressing and we could not make the machine. So we switched to the 68,000. To, uh, but Commodore couldn't do that. Uh, the 6502 was what Commodore had. Um, and from a price performance point of view, it could not be beat. Uh, from a future technology point of view, um, it was, if not a complete dead end, at least a shallow cul-de-sac. Um, there, there were ways out of it that uh, uh, Western Design Center and Bill Mensch had managed to construct, um, but that wasn't the direction that, uh, that Commodore was going for the Commodore 64. But wasn't we didn't have any of Sorry, wasn't the 128 meant to recover that? But that was that was after that was after Dad left Commodore. So uh, that that's a completely different set of people and engineers. Um, so if you're starting from scratch, fresh, um, you're going to use a completely different architecture. Than the C64 and the and the ST was again um, designed to be the the best power for both the dollar and the technology that you could possibly get from readily available technology. It was easy to share the bus too on the sixty eight thousand. Yeah, that was that, that was that was a that was a great um, uh, advantage uh, that that chip had over the um, um, over the Intel family. Yes. Yep. Uh, one of the uh, one of the fun things to do if you want to get really into the nerd weeds is look at the video hardware design for Commodore's machines. Atari's machines and Apple's machines. Um, the Commodore 64 and the Atari ST use the same approach um, for how memory will interact with video and processor. The Atari 800 and the Amiga use the same process, the, the same concepts. Um, because the same guy, J Minor, designed both. And it's clear that somebody deep at the core of Apple's hardware design was afraid of dynamic RAM. If you look at the design of the Apple Macintosh, the video screen was 60 hertz and not NTSC compatible. It had scanline timings that were just slightly off and H blank timings that were just slightly off and it needed to have custom everything. And the reason for it was the video system was used to refresh the DRAM. So all the timing of the video was, con was constrained by the specifications of the RAM. Uh, which no one else was affected by, but somebody at Apple was just terrified of DRAM. <laughs> uh, sorry for getting extremely, is that nerdy or geeky? I'm not sure. Everybody loves it. <laughs> well, I think we've kept Leonard enough here. Uh, thank you so much for your okay. time. Can I ask one one quick thing? Just one very quick. Did your father ever take part in the Steven Spielberg show project? I don't think so. Um, I I don't think he did. He uh, there, there's a lot about his history that's out there. Um, he he did contribute uh, some oral history to I think the uh, the National Holocaust Museum. Uh, certainly cons uh, contributed a bunch of money to the Holocaust Museum. Uh, he talked about his experiences. Um, he, he's and, also and, in, um, 
a movie called Angel of Alam. Yeah, so um, that's that's an amazing story. But uh, the uh, the Angel of Alam uh, was something that he bankrolled, uh, and the the Angel of Alam is is a, a a guy who I had the pleasure of meeting, um, Vernon Tott, who had who was one of the people uh, that came in the day that I described earlier, uh, where the Germans said, "Come with us if you want to live," and killed everybody. Um, and he was, uh, he came in you know, with his uh, regiment and, um, or division or whatever the right army term is. And um, he took pictures of the camp that day. Hmm. And he, uh, he had them developed and couldn't look at them because they were just too hard. And he had them in his attic. And then many years later, a fellow survivor, um, after he retired, said, I need to find these people and thank them. So from memory, he drew the insignia that was on the shoulder on, on the arm of the uh, of the soldiers, sent it to the Pentagon and said, Who are these people? How could I find them? They told him it was the, I forget the number, rail splitter battalion in um, South Dakota uh, and started a, a discussion. And Vernon went, huh, I've got pictures of that day and took them down. And there's a book, uh, the pictures are available. Um, and the, there's a movie about this whole interaction. Uh, it just, it's, it's wonderful. What's that movie called? Excuse me? What's the name of the, the film? The Angel of Alam. Um, A-H-L-E-M, Alam. I have one question if I can, Nico. Thank you. Yeah, um, please, Justin. Uh, and Leonard, thank you so much for your time and, and all these insights and history here. I, I just wonder what was it like back at that time in the 80s? You know, so, so much has changed in the world due to this technology, really transformational and disruptive, um, where, you know, kids are using computers so young and, and just the fabric of life has changed and that, you know, I'm sitting in bed here just surrounded by computers, <laughs> frankly, and it's like totally normal. Back in the 80s, when you were doing these things, if you were to think forward 40 years, did, did you foresee how much the world would change through what you were doing? Um, or was it really more just like tactical, trying to accomplish a goal? Um, what, what, did, what did you think that 2023 would be like back then? Never thought about it. Um, I remember being in a homebrew computer club meeting in 1976 or 1977 and meeting Steve Jobs, who was running up and down the, the aisles of the, of the lecture hall we were meeting and saying, we're all going to be rich. Everyone's going to buy one of these things. It's amazing. Um, and as far as he was concerned, the reason everyone was going to buy one of these things was because everyone was going to learn to program. And they were going to buy computers so they could become programmers. <laughs> um, this turned out um, not to be accurate. Uh, slight understatement there. Um, I, I'm the sort of, I, I'm sort of the uh, of the of of an opposite opinion. I don't think that much has changed. People are still people. The laws of physics are still the laws of physics. Life is very much like it has always been. Are there differences? Hell yeah. Uh, in, in the you know, 70s and 80s, there's no way we could do what we're doing now. I mean, I've, I'm sitting on my laptop. Um, I'm currently about 600 miles from my house. Um, and I can 
remote desktop into my machine at the same time as I'm having conversations with video with people as far away as Spain. Uh, yes, that is different. But life itself is pretty much the same. Great question, Justin. So you weren't thinking about the future. Chuck Peddle was thinking about sci-fi and time travel, and you guys were business focused. Well, Chuck was Chuck wanted to make the he wanted he he didn't think he could change the world. He knew the world he wanted, so he wanted to build the tools that would allow the world to develop in that direction. And I think to a large extent, he, he succeeded. We're not in the world of um, the door into summer, uh, but we're kind of headed there. When I think about the supercomputer that's in my pocket, um, ubiquitous computing is, uh, is a thing. Not quite where he thought, but not all that far. Leonard, when I say thank you, I, I thank you and I thank your father and your family for all that you've done. And you are most welcome, sir. Changing our lives and bringing people together and all the people that I've met that become family at the computer shows and people that I call brothers now um, and sisters. And, and this is something that runs deep. So thank you so much. You are most uh, welcome. Honored and humbled. And uh, hope to have you back Leonard. for part two. Already. Great seeing you. Good talk to everybody. If you ever find yourself in Toronto, thank you. I'm like going to keep on nice Thank you, Leonard. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, we've still got some family up in Toronto, so uh, uh, I obviously haven't been there for a couple of years. There's there's been this thing going around that you may have heard of uh, that's limited some travel, uh, but uh, yeah, well, I'll be up there at some point. World of Commodore 2023. <laughs> when is it this year? Uh, do we have a date yet? It's it's in December though. It's not the best time of year to come visit. <laughs> I, I, that that is true. It's they they treat you really well, Leonard. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm sure they they treat me fine. The question is, what will the uh, prevailing winds do to me? But but you have to bring the wooden pet with you. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do that. I mean, it's World of Commodore. World of Commodore. Where else? Under, you... Understood. <laughs> the, the the wooden pet has been to the world of Commodore. Hey, Bill Hurt, get, talk him into coming to New Jersey. Build a new one. <laughs> Remake it. Make a new wooden we, pad. We can make it better, faster, cheaper, stronger. No, that's a that's a different <laughs> that's a different story. All righty. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. You're most welcome. Really good to see you, Bill. Good seeing you, Leonard. You you look and sound great, man. <laughs> I've uh, I've spent the last uh, few days visiting with my uh, two and four year old grandkids. So, wow, that, that'll, that'll make you young. Uh, yeah, until yeah, until you spend an hour. Ooh, they <laughs> they want to fly around the room like you know some cartoon character. And you pick up the four-year-old, and you pick up the two-year-old, and you pick up the four-year-old, and after a while, you don't feel so young anymore. <laughs> wow, cool! Hey, I I've got a a, a memory of your dad that a Albert Charpentier uh, shared with me. Um, he was talking about being going to one of the shows in Germany, and your dad said, "I built this road," and ah. he, he meant it. Yeah, he uh, um, he did some interesting things as a slave laborer. Um, I think most of the time that he spent in Alam was working for Continental Tire Company, making um, truck tires and tank tread. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, okay. they uh, uh, he he had some hands-on experience that he wished that he didn't have right right so hey if we can talk eric klein into doing like friday saturday vcf would you be up for 
anything like doing a speaker thing or something? Sure. All right. Absolutely. And I'm I'm going to, I want to lev leverage that, uh, you know, we just had a great VCF out East and, and on Friday we packed the room. So I'm like Friday, Saturday worked for us. Maybe it can work for West. Yeah. Let's see what we can do. All right. Very good. Cool. All righty. So good seeing you again. Yep. Absolutely. Right. And nice. Thanks uh, everybody for your patience. Sorry. <laughs> and nice, uh, nice meeting and seeing some people again. Yeah. T-Pug's great.